Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and welcome to Galileo Conquest, part 17. So, yeah, we have some sites to spend after that glorious, triumphant trip to that uh, city in space, uh, that moon called SETI. So we need to uh, spend it all on something. So, yeah, we've got uh, field science, which is basically all sorts of interesting little wheelie parts here, plus the scan, been there, done that. That's a scanner that is designed to help me find little, um, you know, anomalies, which we haven't really gone hunting for in this, I, I will say. I think we've seen some clues using the orbital scanners, but we haven't found it. I'm not sure I need that just yet. We have... Well, logistics, which is storage bays and stuff, which I should probably really find a use for at some point. Um, high power electrics. Well, oh, nice batteries. Lots of batteries, batteries, batteries. That, that is probably likely to be actually useful to me in the short term because I do need more batteries. I think I'm taking that. Okay, 395 left, atmospheric fluid scanner type thing, unmanned tech. No, you know what? I'm going to take those electronics because it's always good to unlock new sciencing technologies. Meanwhile, back in space, it's time to check in with our long endurance astronauts, Natari and Valentina. Well, their habitation module tells us that we have one more day of them feeling happy. But, um,. Well, uh, some examination of the control panel discovered that I had made some errors. I thought, I was wondering why things weren't working quite as well as you expect, and it turns out that if you right-click on some of these modules, you can start the life support, and you can start the habitat. Now, I'm not sure why a habitat would need to be started, but after starting it, I got 17 days worth of habitation out of it. Starting the other one gets me up to 33. These seem to be doing a pretty good job here. Uh, there's another habitat, which uh, hitchhiker storage container. Starting that up, what does it give me? Uh, indefinite and one year. So wait, Valentino, with two levels of skill, can apparently stay in space forever. The only problem here is that if you look, we are actually draining electric charge. So this spacecraft, as it's built right now, simply doesn't have the electrical power to sustain the level of life support that these uh, crew members are demanding. They need more power, presumably to run their PlayStation 4s and back massagers? I don't know. Well, as it happened, I had planned on sending them a care package. Uh, I thought originally I would send them some nice chocolates, food, that kind of thing, and of course a spacecraft to allow them to return home, but it seems that the solar power issue is the main thing I have to be concerned with. So this very small rocket is carrying a pretty light payload on its nose. I apparently overcooked the initial initial vertical burn and had to force the gravity turn to be a little sooner than I had originally expected. And to be quite honest, I am pretty proud of how I managed to fit this into that tiny little fairing. Yes, yes, this made efficient use of the fairing space, unlike at Discover. For those of you that don't remember, Discover was of course launched to the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun. In fact, the upper stage of that Falcon 9 is further away from the Earth than any others. And it was able to do it because Discover was a very small, very lightweight, very cheap spacecraft. And of course, the SpaceX Falcon 9 fairings are a one-size-fits-all deal. So. Giant spacecraft the size of a school bus fit in there, as do spacecraft the size of a dishwasher. Anyway, this, on the other hand, is Benny Cake, and what I've managed to do is fit three different spacecraft into this single fairing. And importantly, it also has a probe core attached, so it can fly automated style and begin its rendezvous with the, the Klonrichert station in orbit. Because I hear that Clon Rickert is deserving of an upgrade. No, this prime attraction will not end up disappearing up somebody's butt. Am I giving away the plot? Is that spoilers? Who cares? 
I mean, I actually have been giving away what's been happening in uh, Galileo Conquest because I've decided that I'm going to start recording basically all the unedited gameplay is going to be streamed on Twitch because uh, otherwise it ju I just record so much stuff and do so much uh, messing around and spend so much time building it and it all gets lost and I might as well just turn on the streaming at the same time. So this was Wednesday night, what I was doing. And of course, this is the edited version. So we're coming in for rendezvous here with the with the Clon Rickert station here, and I have a very very small engine on this because really the capsule is just designed to get the crew home. It isn't designed to do much else. It just provides a bit of space that is proof against, or is it is a uh, toughened again? It is armored against the uh, the the re-entry heat that they will experience something that can return the crew back to the surface and uh, yeah because it has such a small engine I completely messed things up it t it tells me now it's going to take 33 seconds to stop so I fly right past the station at over a hundred kilometers per hour that's not good uh, in fact if I had hit the station that would have been really bad which is the opposite of good many of you uh, English experts will know out there. And you know, the other side of streaming this stuff live is that I can't save and reload, so if bad things happen like that, I, I couldn't have lied and like pre just F5 the whole thing, because that would have been uh, very dishonest and you guys would have rightly called me on it, so good thing that that was a close fly past rather than an actual uh, encounter impact whatever. So having cancelled out the velocity, it's just a your standard docking maneuver. We're attaching it to the far end docking port for I know because I like symmetry and <laughs> it is symmetrical if I attach it there. If I'd hung it off the side, it would have looked weird. Now it just looks like a very very. It's going to look like a longer and longer spacecraft. I think what I might do is once I've explored some of those other planets out there, once I have an idea what kind of requirements I will need to send a crew there. I will probably slap engines on this and then send it off into deep space. I already have unlocked the nuclear thrusters, so uh, I'll probably start attaching tanks to the side once I figure out what I'm doing. But yeah, we went in for a docking here, and frankly, I was quite, well, I was really quite happy with how close this docking ended up. There, just the slight touch. And it just swung in there and caught perfectly. Look at that. Now, the next step in this mission, the two payloads I'm carrying are basically power units. They're giant solar panels, so they have a little probe body, little reaction control thrusters, little antenna. They use the tape antenna, which... If you don't know, tape antenna are actually pretty common in CubeSat designs. You basically take metal measuring tapes and you can turn them into antenna. And the nice thing is that they're designed to roll up into very compact uh, spaces. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a very cheap piece of commodity hardware you can buy and you can turn them into antenna that roll up very neatly and nicely. And that roll-up uh, technique was also demonstrated for solar arrays recently using something called ROSA, the roll-out solar array. I keep wanting to say roll-up solar array, but they actually roll out. It's just a new way of packaging the solar arrays to make them rigid and light. And uh, yeah, they will probably find more and more use since they provide a pretty solid solar system in a pretty compact package. Anyway, these solar arrays, they attach using the, the Clampatron Junior. And that means that gives us, uh, I don't know, it was basically designed to attach things like this. So these drop in there and they have a pair of solar panels. This antenna, of course, the tape antenna is extremely long. We can roll out the solar panels or deploy them. Beautiful. That should give us enough power, uh, at least as soon as day breaks around here. Let's just make sure that happens, because we want to see how we're doing. Nice! That is really starting to look the part. But we have a second one here. We put spa three spacecraft up here, three different components, and this one will now fly down the length to join its companion at the far end. 
So, yeah, the Rosa experiment on the space station, it was actually carried on the Dragon in the unpressurized trunk area. So very similar to that spacecraft that I have, the Dragon has a pressurized segment for supplies and it has space left over, has payload left over. So what they have is an unpressurized section at the rear where they can load stuff in that can be uh, dragged out. Things like... Um, they deployed a new mating adapter for, for new spacecraft. They uh, carried up some new supplies that sit on the truss structure. And in this case, they carried an experiment in the form of the rollout solar array. So they pulled that out, held it with the, uh, with the arm, the robotic arm, the manipulator, deployed it, and then just let it sit there for a week while it collected data. Now that it's been approved, now that everything's worked, I think they basically take it and they've stuck it back in the trunk. And, well, the trunk is what gets destroyed when the dragon returns to Earth. The you got to remember that these supply missions to the space station are also garbage disposal missions. I mean, the dragon capsule returns some material to the surface, some uh, cargo, but the Cygnus... Everything in the Cygnus ends up burning up, which does make me wonder why they decided to name one after Rick Husband. Anyway, with the fully powered space station ready to roll, we turn ourselves towards the sun so that it may better illuminate our power-grabbing panels. Yes, they start to hum to life to start converting those photons into cascading electrons and capturing them, forcing them through circuits, generating power for our electrical systems. And now we're able to start the life support unit. And we have a truly self-sufficient space station now. Everything here is running. And now Valentina can stay in space indefinitely, or at least until the food runs out. So it seems that we're going to have to send some crew further afield so that they can get some skills, some experience, and then we can send them out on a longer trip. But before that longer trip, we need, uh, you know, we, we need more volunteers. And it turns out that one of the missions that we get offered is a space camp. Mortimer is constantly complaining about the cost of hiring new astronauts. Rather than wasting our funds on training recruits or picking whichever Kerbals happen to be in need of rescue from Kerbin orbit, we should send up a space camp and train paid tourists to join the space program. Bring the tourists and some instructors to on a long-term training facility in orbit, and when they come home, we'll see which ones are good candidates for joining the space program. And so, in honor of one of the greatest camping experiences in sitcom history, we have the Tony Lynch. The design for this came, well, was established during the, the live stream. And, well, the plan is, instead of sending all this crew up to a space station, they are going to be the space station. You see, I'm going to have to put them in spacecraft to send them up there. I'm going to need roughly the same amount of spacecraft space to bring them home. So, you know, as long as I can keep them alive, they're not going to mind that they get homesick after like a few hours and won't do anything. Yeah, this is going to be very bare bones accommodation, but you know, they are paying for it and space travel is expensive. I mean, really, how can we truly understand or how can we truly assess the capabilities of these potential recruits unless we put them in the situation, the kind of situations they may have to experience. Look at them down there in the bottom right. So many of them, so many fun names. Want some of these? Some of these may be going to space as professional astronauts at some point in the future. But right now, we have 14 paying customers. They're going to stay in space for 40 days. And they have three instructors, a scientist, an engineer, and of course a pilot. A pilot who has gone as far as SETI. They also paid for this uh, magnificent firework display which we are about to witness. The boosters of course come off Korolev cross style, spreading their wings across the atmosphere, looking, looking like a four-pointed star, or a cross, or... Oh, look, they're like braiding it. There we go. Look, falling down through the clouds, and they're not slowing down, are they? 
they are gonna hit the surface at almost Mach 1. All four of them. I don't think many are gonna be left after this. Still, perhaps some billionaire will find their remains in the future. So, 40 days means that I have to take care of a particular maneuver for the Assumpta spacecraft. The Assumpta is headed towards Icarus and needs to perform a plane change maneuver to make sure that Assumpta is in the correct plane. Now, if you remember, this one had a very bare-bones satellite and as much engine and fuel as we could reasonably fit into each stage. So it has... This is one of the upper stages that we kept attached because we wanted the extra fuel that it was going to supply. But now that's gone, we're down to the Beagle and the... Well, the final stage, whatever that is. You'll notice that we also got science info. You can point the camera at the sun for some reason. I'm surprised the science message doesn't say why the hell are you pointing your fancy camera at the sun. That doesn't tend to be very good for it. That is, of course, what Alan Bean discovered on Apollo 12. He accidentally pointed the camera into the sun while he was repositioning it and managed to burn out the imaging system, which was, well, unfortunate. That might explain his post-space art career, where he's trying to do the equivalent of a courtroom sketcher, trying to render all the things that he saw on the moon that couldn't be rendered by uh, that camera. Or, more likely, he just likes painting things. Anyway, after that manoeuvre, it doesn't put us exactly on target because of phasing issues, but uh, I do have, I did have it set up that I would create that second manoeuvre, 4,923 metres per second will put me on an encounter with Icarus, that'll be another like 30 days away. And now of course we return to our space camp, Tony Lynch! The Tony Lynch Memorial Station orbiting in space. And I'm sure they've been having an amazing time there, uh, singing songs and playing hide and seek. Unfortunately, they managed to leave the Scrabble and the Travel Scrabble behind. I mean, yes, it may be 40 very crushed, very uh, repetitive days flying around uh, Gale, but they are in for the ride of their lives during descent because. Uh, well, I, I actually thought very hard about how to safely bring back a spacecraft of this size. When I was designing this, I was extremely concerned that having a large, long spacecraft might mean that when it landed, it fell over and exploded. So, this spacecraft is going to be designed to split into parts and have all five crew areas land individually. But furthermore, these crew cabins are chosen for their cheapness, for their low mass. Uh, this mission was actually over budget compared to the rewards offered. But we did get some free astronauts, or we will get some free astronauts, assuming I don't kill them all. Anyway, the idea is that we have these rocket engines on here, and most of the speed will be removed by the rocket engines rather than relying on heat shields. Because if, if I split it up in the upper atmosphere, yes, each part might individually land, but they would all probably go beyond the two and a half kilometer limit and get unloaded and they would be called dead. So I have to keep them all together during descent in a single spacecraft. And that meant, if you stack them, that it's not going to slow down enough. In fact, it will probably burn up, which is why we have about two kilometers per second of delta V left in this thing to essentially stop it in orbit and bring it down safely. But that whole descent process takes a really long time. I had to baby this thing through the atmosphere very carefully and it turned out I made some mistakes. But we're going to cover that in the next episode. Will they get down safely? You're going to find out. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.